So, let's look to the weeds. Because the point of this is learning to see. And so we didn't have really enough time. We should spend a day just in the garden learning how to see. Right? And we should start earlier, by the way. It's already getting kind of hot. But if you want to see a lot of insects, looking to the weeds is where you're going to see them. I think we've already been reiterating that a lot. The wild is where stuff is. And a lot of our most recalcitrant weeds, especially when going to see, become infested with aphids. Maybe a cause for concern, right? Aphids are bad? We'll see. All right. Wild is dynamic. I think we've probably got that across to people today, right? Um, whether by design or from overwhelm, oftentimes I have wild because I just can't keep up with it. Wild just happens, you know? And I've learned to appreciate that, to see that that's actually a plus, that it teaches me. Ditches, edges, perennial beds, they tend to trend wild. Truthfully, our farmscaping patches tend to trend wild. You know, we put in farmscaping plants, but then other ones put themselves in. And they're all good, you know? And indeed, before you look at something and think it's problematic, watch a little longer and see what happens. The last thing important for me was that wild lettuce, which just drove me nuts until I finally just relaxed into it and saw the good that was happening with it. Not that I still don't have to control it, we'll talk about that more later. This is a farmscaping plant, and the rest of the farmscape has been covered up, but it's a wonderful farmscaping plant. It's a, it is a cultivar of mullein. Mullein's a wonderful farmscaping plant, but it also adds wonderful beauty to the garden. And it's got tons of beneficial insects at the right time of day. And then, for many growers, wild may be synonymous with overwhelm, it certainly is for me, um, but it can bear special gifts. Some of our most recalcitrant weeds, burdock, goldenrod, wild lettuce, milkweed, provide nectar and pollen when they're in bloom, but then as they're going to seed, right, I mentioned out in the greenhouse, their energy is leaving defense, right? They're not defending themselves as much as they're racing to make their seed, and that's when the aphids move in. And this is one of my favorite aphid infestations. I have, I have a favorite aphid infestations. <laughs> um, and this is on goldenrod. This is the goldenrod aphid. And I've seen one in a friend's greenhouse once on a chrysanthemum. But they're pretty darn specific to goldenrod. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the goldenrod is doing fine. I don't think we have to worry about the goldenrod and the aphids on it. But I took this picture trying to get a picture of just the ladybug on the goldenrod to give an example and missed totally that right there is a lacewing larva. And indeed, we're going to look at another iteration of this in a moment, and we'll see some other life that's on there too. And now all of a sudden, rather than being a um, concern, it's actually something I'm grateful for. Right? It's, it is ramping up my level of beneficials. Few plants self-seed more abundantly and dynamically than wild lettuce. Um, you can try and control it. You're not going to eradicate it. That's a pipe dream because it's just going to keep blowing in and it, it just like every one of those flowers makes a little puff of white fluff each one of those white fluffs little things in it is a seed and the wind blows if you're trying to pull it out it's scattering while you're trying to pull it out so is it part of the red line thing it is it is asteraceae yeah yeah mm -hmm. and indeed it has many medicinal qualities if you catch lisa during the meal she she would tell you a lot, of, a lot about what's good, how good it is um, and it's a bioaccumulator for sure too, but it's it's got to be controlled. It'll take over things if you don't control it. But while it's in bloom, which is going to be whether you try to keep it from being in or not, it's feeding the beneficials. And once it gets that aphid po population, it does even better. We're um, feeding it beneficials. It's a dance, right? We have to know when to intervene and when not, when not to. And this is the CMAC ladybug that we looked at in the greenhouse, and it is on wild lettuce. And that wild lettuce actually is scary to me because it's got the, the propagation seed fluff there. And so no matter what I do to try and get that out, short of putting a bag over it very gently and cutting it, when I remove it, I'm spreading it. You know, and it spreads all the time. So much as I want to have the beneficial insect activity, if I'm on top of it, which I rarely am, by the way, probably all the better for the insects, right? <laughs> um, I would nip that just as, a, as the flowers were starting to set seed. And I would have gotten lots of aphid activity and lots of beneficial activity. But if I, if I nipped it with a big enough piece of stalk and just dropped it on the ground, that'd be good for the beneficials, but it would still set seed. I mean, its ability to set seed is very impressive. You know, it's, it's a very dynamic plant to be appreciated for its resilience. Um, there aren't any guarantees if you do this kind of stuff, if you, if you trust weeds and go with it, it doesn't always work out, sorry. That's nature, you know? Nature works out for something, but you, your plan may not be the plan at the moment, you know? 
And so goldenrod is one of my favorite beneficials. There's going to be another slide where we'll see some more um, you know, insect activity on the aphids. It definitely feeds the um, beneficials with the flowers in the fall. It's a major part of nectar in the fall and pollen. Um, and by the way, I always have to say this, it is not what causes hay fever. If you bring in a bunch of goldenrod and it starts people sneezing, it's because there was some giant ragweed or some ragweed nearby and the pollen blew onto the um, goldenrod and that's what's getting you. It's not the goldenrod. Um, so don't let it take that bad rap. Goldenrod actually vectors this remarkable kind of ancient pre-virus called Aster yellows. And even though it's called Aster yellows and it's known to be in the asters too, um, the wild asters, I never have much of a problem if there's only wild asters around, but if we have a lot of goldenrod, um, we can start to have problems with aster yellows, particularly hitting celery. So on the other hand, we know that, but we don't take out the goldenrod. We can't, we love it too much. It's just too, you know, too special. And then ants, you know, this is a burdock, and burdock is one of those plants I just mentioned that get in, 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 aphid infestations. It'll bring in the predators to then control the aphids, and then you ramp up your predator populations. Once in a while, the ants get on there, and if the ants are on there, the predators aren't coming in because the ants chase them away. And so, in that case, your aphid population is doing you no good. It's doing the ants good, and it isn't really doing you no good because the entire environment includes the ants and they belong there too. So it's just the ants turn there. We don't always get what we want. That's an ongoing theme if you allow nature to go its way. You know? We get what we need though, right? And wild as I just talked about it, it, it can just be amazing how many seeds can blow away from one plant. So you're gonna, you're gonna have problems from these weeds and yet you also get benefits from them. So it's about relaxing into it. And as I said back there one slide before, knowing when to intervene when to decide to intervene, and managing to do that. Sometimes you don't get to, um, and that's the dance, that you know, working with nature rather than trying to control nature um, invites us to. Okay. Sometimes we lose, but if we look, we can learn. Um, past activity begets a response from beneficials. Part of the dance is knowing when to hold your fire, which I'm always encouraging us, don't just kill bugs because you think they might be a problem. Um, figure out for sure that they are. That was my point about the leaf-footed um, bug. It may well be a problem where you are, but you want to be sure before you go spending your time killing a lot of bugs that may just be adding to the diet. Um, and in this case, I lost this a crop of cauliflower because I know that Pecona wasp, right there, cocoons, right? These guys were laid in these cross-striped cabbage worms, right? And then they killed that cabbage worm right, feeding on it, and then came out of the dead body and spun cocoons, and they're gonna go fly around and do it again. And so I should have control, right? This works for me all the time with the European cabbage worm, okay, with other cabbage worms. But I was, you know, my, my team just wanted to spray BT, which you can use. You can use BT, it's really pretty darn good for organic growers, it's, it's targeted, right? It's only gonna kill the larva of Lepidoptera, right, moths and butterflies, if they feed on where you spray it, right? So if you're careful about where you spray it, it's only gonna kill your pest, right? So why would we use it all the time? We wouldn't use it all the time because then we don't have the ability to rear more of these things to keep us from having to spray. And so I just wanted us to hold our fire until the pest um, got into balance with the parasitoid. And my guys are freaking out because that's a lot of damage, right? That's a whole lot of damage. And finally, I called up my guru, my, my mentor, Dr. Richard McDonald, or Dr. McBug. I asked him about cross striped cabbage worm. He said, Pat, you have to spray. What? He said, yeah. The cross striped cabbage worm is gregarious. See how many are there? They, they, they are laid and they, they mass on a plant. And before the control can build up, they take it out. And so sometimes you do have to spray. You have to know when. Mm -hmm. And usually you learn that the hard way. I did. We didn't get much of a crop. I lost a lot of cauliflowers because I waited too long. That's okay. Well, it's okay for the, it certainly is okay for the Pecona wasp because there are a lot of them. You know, I was so, saying because it was cauliflower. Uh, <laughs> well, this one happened to be the purple cauliflower, which eats like a broccoli. Should so, we, should you know. we plant some sacrifice plants? You can, yeah, you can definitely plant some sacrifice plants. That's a good plan. Yeah, if you just say, these I'm going to let happen, so that I'm building up my Pecona wasp populations, you know. Um, you might get more control next time. You certainly will reduce the numbers of cross-striped cabbage worms, and that's the ultimate goal, right? 
They have some cross-striped cabbage worm problems, but not enough that it economically matters to you. you know, and at that point, you don't have to spray. We sadly do spray more BT here than I would personally do it, because it's hard to get people to trust that it's going to work. And that 40%, the farmers don't trust it. My crew doesn't trust it either. They're looking at it, it makes them nervous, they want to spray. It's hard when you make a living to trust, and yet it does work mm -hmm. if you can, and it saves you money, and yet it saves you time if you can bring yourself to do it. Okay, this one here is a bad picture of something that I definitely, I'm gonna try and blow it up a little bit so you can see that. And I purposely put it in there for two reasons. So right there in the corner, okay, you can probably see it, right? That is some kind of a wasp. I'd say likely Baconid. I talked to Dr. McDonald, he thought so too. I normally wouldn't put this up, but I have it there for two reasons, because it's about learning to see. Sometimes what you want to do is look at the mess, right? The things you hate to look at sometimes are going to teach you the most. And that's the case with this plant. I could actually put another slide in there. This was um, broccoli rob that was like allowed to go to flower and not, we didn't harvest all of it. And so once again, it was starting to make seed and then the aphids came in and just made a mess out of it. It's ugly as can be. Just imagine, it, like you can see, all the aphids there, aphids there. <coughs> Indeed, if we blew this up, that's probably a, a parasitized one. They're in there. Aphids everywhere. And then indeed, white fly, just like all kinds of pests, right? But right here in the corner, um, probably a recorded wasp laying its eggs in there. And so when you see that, you know that you're getting the control. You don't have to worry about those aphids. Why the picture is here besides getting that point across is that I couldn't see that with my eye. It was too small and it's all happening too fast. Just going in and kind of looking at the whole thing and using a smartphone to get a picture allowed me to pull it out and see it. So that can help you to see and learn to understand. You know, this, this is not a, a, a presentation quality slide, to tell you the truth, but it is a great scouting tool and that's the point of it. You know? And so looking at those messes is where you're going to see a lot of what, a lot of what the future solution is. You know? And that's what I say here. It's the beginning of balance. If you have that happening and you don't mess with it, then you're going to raise your levels of Baconid wasp. And by the way, that Baconid wasp, as we were just discussing, it is going to be feeding on the brassica flowers, the adult. The adult is not feeding on the aphids. It's simply laying its eggs in the aphids. So the plant is taking care of the full cycle. It's supplying the pests. The pests are supplying the home for the pollinator that also is protecting it. And so the whole complex is united. And if you let the whole thing happen, you're going to have much more diversity. And when that, when that Baconian wasp feeds on that flower, it is going to lay rather than 30 eggs, it's going to lay 300. And so by giving it a chance to feed, you ramp up. And that's how you get biocontrol. That's why farmscaping works. And so many people put it in, they don't believe it'll work. And then all of a sudden they're blown away because it works. And like, but the pests are still here. But because you haven't been interrupting their cycles and allowing them to work in their natural cycle, their levels of predation or par being parasitized are way higher. And that's how you get control. So you just let it all happen. And it is easier to focus on the problems, like we just saw, if we like the big picture. And this is what our garden looks like in most years when we haven't been totally rained out and had to do a lot of repair from letting a lot of nasty nut sedge come up and stuff. And as you can see, there's a lot of diversity in there, a whole lot of diversity. And that diversity, you know, there's sunflowers stacked throughout it. There's farmscaping patches, like right there. We can't see it very well, but that's a farmscaping patch. There's another one there. Um, they're scattered throughout the whole place. We've got bachelor buttons there. Valerian in bloom, which blooms for a long time. Golden rye going to be coming on. Um, you know, just a great diversity of plants in bloom. And by doing that, we get that depth and we get that, that control. The big picture is good, so it's okay. In fact, the, um, right, if I, if I have a bigger picture, someplace right about there is where that um, broccoli rob was that was such a mess. And it, you know, I had to convince people not to pull out. You know? So you have to do that. I mean, it just looks like crap and you just want to get rid of it. But actually, if you just wait a few weeks, instead of there being, you know, tons of aphids, there'll be lots of golden balls or brown balls that are allowing aphids, I mean, broconian wasps to hatch out and fly around and look for more aphids in your garden. Um, and then key to all that too is right there, Marshall is spraying compost tea. And 
a really important um, vignette that I actually haven't seen it even written about yet, but I'm sure people know it besides me. I was teaching a class, and for various reasons, we had a potato patch that was totally covered up with potato peels. The farmscaping wasn't working, and the problem was nutrition. The potatoes did not have the nutrition. In the class, we were going to do a compost tea demonstration. A severe lightning storm meant we couldn't do it. I took the compost tea and threw it on these very starved potatoes, right? The next week, a beekeeper was in the class, arrived early, and when I got there, he said, Pat, come here, look at this, I've never seen it. Barn swallows, there was a barn full of barn swallows flying all around, taking bugs out of the air, which is what they do. Barn swallows were landing on our deer fence and jumping down to the potatoes and picking the potato beetles and potato beetle larva off. That's a habit that barn swallows don't have at all. Right? And I'm going, why is this happening? It's like the nutrition. They had, the plant had enough energy to put out the signal, come here and eat. And why am I pretty certain that's why? Because they didn't do anything more for those poor potatoes. They weren't really part of what we were teaching anymore. And that one compost tea feed was good for a week or two. And then it went back to starved potatoes. Guess what? Barn swallows flying around, all kinds of potato beetles on those potatoes. No interaction. But if it had the food, right, which is what the tea is doing, right, if the plant is well, well nourished, then it can interact with its environment. And one of the things it does is let the predators know, come here. It's not just that the predators are searching, the plant is colluding. The plant is sending out pheromones saying, I have a meal for you, and I'm happy to feed you. It works for both of us. And so, Basically, you want that big picture. If you have that big picture, those messes are okay. Um, and how you get the big picture? Farmscaping plants. There are many lists and formulas, and people always want these lists and formulas. And I give them to people because they have to have them, and they get irritable if I don't give them to them. And it reassures them that they know what to do. But really, how you learn what to do is you get out in your garden. You be out there, and you be unfocused. You let all of your vision see everything and you find the plants that are really working in your garden at the times of year they're working, and you reproduce those things over and over again. You develop your own list that is specific to your garden, and that is going to give you the most dynamic formula there is. And you can't take that formula and move it to somebody else's garden and have it be exactly the same. All these plants do kind of work, but the combinations of stuff are going to be the ones that you see that work the best. And sometimes, like, I've, I've been missing... Um, access to um, Pacifica chrysanthemum for about 15 years. And it turns out the Pacifica chrysanthemum where I last was using it at the Highland Lake Inn gives a huge nectary at the end of October. And you can walk to that garden and hear the buzz from like 50 feet away. And you get out there and there's clouds and clouds of insects feeding on it. And it's a really expensive, nice um, ornamental and hard to find. I just ordered three of them. I was doing research for this class and bumped into it. And they're coming. And they're easy to propagate. So in a couple of years, I'll be giving door prizes away. And I pray it's not a native, but sometimes, you know, things work that aren't natives too. And it's not invasive, that's for sure. Okay, so in this is borage, chives, um, feverfew, poppy, calendula, dill. Those are the things I can see. And the way we do it, I left the slide out. But we have a flat full of farmscaping plants. And when we go out to plant, we just pick an arbitrary place and stick a bunch of plants in. All pretty close together. We don't really need these to be booming. We just want to have that you know, concentration that calls them in. Um, and then a bunch of them live and a bunch don't. And they self-seed and they basically create their own systems. And we just let those happen. All right. Milkweed has, has deservedly become iconic. It's revered as a nursery for monarchs. Um, milkweed perfumes the air as it attracts multitudes of butterflies and other insects. And as it goes to seed, it is beset by aphids, but uh, and also the milkweed seed bug. There's the milkweed seed bug. I don't know if you know that one, but the rest of the predatory world, the hungry world, definitely knows it, and they feed on it. You know, they feed on it as much as aphids. And so there's large numbers of milkweed seed bugs and aphids on every milkweed. Almost, I've never seen milkweed that didn't eventually get both of them. And the milkweed does fine once again, but it's feeding all kinds of beneficials because it's there. And here is a milkweed leaf. And this is a great example of what happens with diversity because on here you have not just uh, hoverfly or surfeit fly larva feeding on, on 
um, aphids, these are the aphids here, but you also have a baconid wasp having parasitized an aphid. And then, just so you know that, ape, that um, serpent flies can be different colors, this is not on um, milkweed, this is probably on a cucumber leaf, I think, I'm assuming. But once again, it's the same complex. The same predators are in here, and so you have a serpent fly. And this, is, this actually shows you what they're more often going to look like. That yellow is kind of anomalous, the way it looked, just the angle. But they are kind of translucent. They have that line down their center, and um, they can come in yellow or green. And if you look at large numbers of aphids, you're going to see these guys. They're all over the place. And then, once again, lo and behold, right there, Bacon and Wasp. And this, this one here, if I take in the time to find another slide, someplace off to the side, a little tiny orange worm that is the Aphidolides larva. And that is a, I'm pretty sure it's a wasp. Is Aphidolides a wasp? It's either, it's either, I'm pretty sure it's a wasp, not a fly. But it also lays this little tiny larva and they prey on aphids also. And a couple of years ago, we were putting out rutabagas and they just had aphids all over them. And my guys were like, Pat, can we please crush these aphids? This is on baby plants. And I said, okay, go ahead and crush them. And moments later, they were like, what are these little orange things? And I said, oh yeah, that's the aphidolides larva. Don't crush that. And they said, well, they're all over. They're everywhere on these. I said, no, leave the aphids alone. Because you know, the solution was right there. You know? And that happens all the time. When you have enough of the pests, then the predators come in. If you go ahead and act to remove the pests, you don't have the predators. This was a really important slide, and actually, I'm not going to have time to, to try and go as much into detail as I want to, but we look all the time around and we see flies, and what do we think, right? Build flies, ooh, flies, swat them, get rid of them, right? This looks a lot like a housefly, doesn't it? But if you see flies in the garden, even if they look like houseflies, odds are very good they're not. And this is uh, a baconid wasp, I mean, not a baconid wasp, but a tachinid, tachinid fly, right? trying to get to lay its eggs in these golden neck caterpillars. These golden neck caterpillars are kind of a pest, but they're kind of incidental pests. These ones were feeding on a blueberry. The blueberries were gonna survive them just fine. Partly why they survive them just fine is they never get big numbers because this guy comes in and lays its eggs in it. And as I say here, this is all talking about the fact that while I was researching for this slideshow, I bumped into a whole stream, I mean pages and pages of people freaking out that tachinid flies were killing all of their monarch butterfly larvae. And they were freaking out because the predation rates were horrible, right? And they were thinking like, what do we do? They were, they were talking about how to trap the kinetic flies. This is going backwards. We are not God. We cannot make the world work. Monarch butterflies and technetic flies have been in balance for hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of years. They haven't needed our help. What we have to worry about for the monarch butterflies is habitat destruction, neonicotinoids, um, and I had a third thing in there now. Climate destruction. Climate, climate, climate change, yes, right. Those are the issues, you know. So rather than figuring out how to trap the technical flies, will they please go to work on those issues? Will they figure out how to use less energy themselves and say we have to address these issues? And let their box stores know they do not want to get plants with neonicotinoids. You know, those are the solutions. It's not trying to wipe out a natural predator. You know, the, the, the way the monarch butterfly supplies that is it reproduces like crazy. And so its percentages are terrible. And right now when it's in danger, that's scary to us. But there is a grassroots movement of people letting milkweed grow everywhere. And that is a solution. It used to be it grew in the ditches that are now hit with Roundup. You know, it used to be in all the fields that now they can round up the heck out of. And so we have to replace that. And we're going to have to keep doing that. We've got to create the wild that our clueless society is wiping out. And pardon me if I sound a little extreme, but sometimes it feels that way. Anyway, I'm inspired by these kids. There are 1,300 tachinid flies. There's one that if I had the time, I would have put the slide in of the tachinid fly on a milkweed. And it is approaching a milkweed seed bud. Likely, it's going to lay a larva in there or release a larva that'll crawl into it. Maybe not, maybe it was just feeding on the honeydew from those aphids that were also there, but there is a tachinid fly that controls true bugs. There's a tachinid fly that controls cabbage loopers. There's a whole array. There are 1,300 of them, and obviously they're preying on all kinds of insects. And 
yeah, they take down a bunch of monarchs, but a bunch of monarchs live, and that's how we get balance. Okay, and then we have like another pest. This is this is a terrible pest. It, it feeds on parsley. It's the parsley worm, right? It also happens to be the young of it's the blue swallowtail, right? Black swallowtail. Yeah, the black swallowtail. And so it's a wonderful swallowtail. I can never kill these guys. I can't kill a tomato hornworm. I find something else to put it on. These insects are just too amazing. The tomato hornworm moth, it's it's same moth. moth. It's an incredible moth. I mean, why would we want to wipe them out? You know, they they are out there pollinating in the evening. This this butterfly is wonderful. I pick this guy up off of my parsley or my carrot and put it on Queen Anne's lace, and it does fine. You know, if I can't find some Queen Anne's lace, I hold on to it. What I do? But I'm not going to kill it. It's just you know too important to me as a as a lovely butterfly. Um, Cup plant, we already covered all that, and so I don't really need to, you know, it's just a great source, you know. I think that's, okay, and then, this is just trusting that you're gonna have control. Um, this is the last slide, I didn't even get to write for it, actually. Um, but basically, you have the control right there. Over here, you've got ladybug larva, and over here, a ladybug larva that's becoming a pupa. And they're on cucumbers, and the cucumbers had aphids. But the aphids never got to build up enough because we had all kinds of plants that were feeding the, the ladybugs. They never, they, you know, we had ladybugs in the greenhouse all winter. And they got down in, you know, if you have a greenhouse that has a bunch of, like, you know, detrius, stuff that we talk about leaving, then those ladybugs find a place to go when it's cold. And when it warms up, they come back out again. They lay their eggs. We don't miss a beat. These, these things are put out in the middle of April. There wouldn't be high numbers of ladybugs from the outside coming in to give us control. We would have aphids problems. But because we have an ongoing population in the greenhouse, we don't have aphid, aphid problems, and aphids were never a problem on this community. And I'm going to actually get back to that presentation and go and explain.